welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. My guest today is Dr. James Fallon, who is a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the University of California, Irvine, and emeritus professor in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. Dr. Fallon is also the author of over 300 papers and books including the book, The Psychopath Inside, A Neuroscientist's Journey into the Dark Side of the Brain. I will be linking his website down below for your reference. Welcome, Dr. Fallon. Lisa, thanks for having me here. Thank you for being here. Um, just to kind of get the audience to, who may not be aware of your story, would you mind sharing with us briefly about the research you did on brain scans when you were age 60 and some of the surprising result that you found? Sure, you know, at that time, and this was around 2005 when this happened, 2006, uh, we were doing clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, some addiction work. And, and also I was analyzing the brain scans, PET scans, and also the gen genetics and uh, psychometrics of killers, you know, some serial murderers, different kinds of uh, killers. And, uh, and so we're doing the, all these in parallel, right? And, and so uh, for the, and I was just finishing up on the analysis of the murderer's brain, some of who were psychopaths, some of who were diagnosed as impulsive murderers, some disorganized, some kind of uncharacterized. But at any rate, while that was going on with the Alzheimer's study, we had all the patients, with Alzheimer's that we needed for the study, but we needed more normals. And, I, and I, I made the error because we were in such a rush to get this clinical trial done and everything that I said, okay, I'll get my family involved. <laughs> it's just like, it's a no, no. And um, so I, I said, look at nobody in my family has Alzheimer's. I said, except my wife's family is a lot of Alzheimer's and I'll ask her. And I, so I did, and I asked the whole family and uh, so they agreed to come in and, and have the scans done and have the genetics done, et cetera, for the Alzheimer's. And, and so when the tests came back, the PET scans, I was sitting there and I was sitting with a pile, I had the pile of murderers, it was a, the scans, you know, you have different sheets and it has different sections for the brain, they're all highly colored and everything. And I had just, I had finished categorizing them and everything when the technicians brought in the scans from the Alzheimer's study of the family. Now, I didn't know we hadn't covered so with tape, so I didn't know which person was which in any of the studies. But of course, I knew that the, you know, the, the, the group I had from was from my family. I didn't know who it was. And I, I, I went quickly through because I've seen thousands of these. So and I kind of could generally know if something's really wrong, pathological, quickly before going back and, you know, analyzing in depth. And so I went through the scans and I went through the pile of my family scans. And it was like, I said, normal, 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 normal. I was, oh man, this is great. And I got to the last one and it was completely pathological, abnormal. And it looked like one of the worst cases of the psychopathic killers that I had been studying for some years, uh, including the new pile that I was uh, looking through. I'd started in 89 doing this. And so, um, I, I so I told the technicians, I said, this is pretty funny, guys. You, you threw in a couple of a murderer's brain into my family and it's ha ha. It's, you know, we fool around in the lab, uh, temporarily fool around. It's not, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to not do this permanently. And so they said, no, no, it's really somebody, somebody in your family. So I said, this person should not be walking around in open society. It was a very dangerous person, really, really bad. And uh and so I had to peel back the tape covering the name on the scan. And when I did, of course, then that's, that was my Gandalf moment when he showed up at my door and that scan that was highly pathological scan had my name on it. And that started this whole thing. Wow. So what exactly is on the brain scan? What are we looking at that tells you it's a psychopath versus a non-psychopath brain? Well, you can't tell by looking at the biological data if somebody is a psychopath or has anything. You have to do that. Uh, you, you get the diagnosis from a psychiatric exam 
-hmm. of somebody, of a, a psychiatrist or psychologist who is an expert in personality disorders, for example, for this particular thing. And they meet with, you know, for several days with each a subject or patient and uh, ask a bunch of structured and unstructured questions and tests. And it's really the psychologist or psychiatrist who gives the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You can't give a diagnosis by looking at a brain scan for anything mm -hmm. uh, or the genetics, but the brain scan, the genetics, all the psychometrics together can tell you why the person has it, right? So it's not if they have it or why they had it. So uh, that's, that's, that's the, the first thing. But when you're looking at a scan, you know, the, there are different kinds of functional brain scans. Everybody knows structural. You get a CT, an MRI, do you see bones and muscles? And they kind of look the same whether you're living or the hour after you're dead, they look the same. But a functional brain scan is a living, uh, a, a living uh, brain, if you will. And in that, uh, depending on the technique, a functional MRI, fMRI, is looking at changes in local blood flow, which reflects changes in metabolic activity for that time that you're doing the test, maybe over an hour. Uh, or in a PET scan, positron emission tomography, you're injecting a radioactive dye, and that dye then over the period of the, the test that you're doing, you know, the, the people looking at you know, tending to something which activates known uh, brain connections called connectomes. And these are functional connectomes that are recognized. And, uh, and it stimulates those also for the, you know, the half hour, hour that you're doing the test, okay, the task itself. Mm -hmm. And, and then you take what comes out of the machine, the electrons, basically. Uh, and then you, you, you reform them into a 3D globe, that is then put onto a standard map of a brain. And then, in that, the, uh, the areas that are very active will give off photons, in the case of, you know, a, a PET scan, and then those are picked up by the detectors, you know, that, that surround your head and your whole body in, in, some, in a PET scan like that. And then those are converted into uh, colored images, which are very standard. It's like looking at a weather map. Is it going to be hotter? So you use red for hotter. It's going to be colder than normal mm -hmm. or colder than comparison. You use blue and green. Mm -hmm. And so you have all these blues and yellows and greens to show some the comparison between the person you're looking at or the group you're looking at, and then controls or people under a different drug or have a different condition. And so that's, you're looking at these sections, each, each section, each person, I'd look through a hundred sections of the brain as they're sliced through this way or this way, you know, it's, it's sliced yeah. in this way and you put those back together. We have an automated way of looking at it. And then, you know, and then I use the neuroanatomical skills to say, aha, this is that pathway that has to do with emotion or this kind of empathy or language, or, you know, all these different functions and dysfunctions. So I will take those and put them together and create a story. It's like a storyboard for a story. So, you know, it's a story of your cognitive and emotional life, if you will, using that. So uh, at any rate, when I do that, I don't know the diagnosis yet, because yeah. I don't want to have, you know, as a scientist or anybody, you don't want to be biased at all but if you know beforehand something you 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 bring with you all you know your biases which are not political or religious or anything like that but their biases like oh i know that pathway you know and so it's done blindly and these were all done blindly okay and so psychopathy there's a high genetic component to this right and I know, as far as we all know, you're not a serial killer. You don't fall under what we would consider like the Hollywood version of what psychopathy is put out there. So can you touch on kind of the nature, nurture, and the genetic component to all of this? Sure. You know, we have about 300, each person has about 350, what are called complex adaptive behaviors and also personality traits. And you as you develop from the time you're born through adulthood, you know, and through, you know, even to old age, these come online. They develop as the brain areas uh, mature. And, and, and if you live in a normal environment, if, you know, just the average environment, you basically are what your genes are, right? And this is what, so, you know, the genetics really determine these basic personality types if nothing else happens, right? And so, 
you're not, there are no psychopath genes because it's, uh, but there are genes that code for traits that psychopaths have. Okay. Okay. That's a difference. It sounds subtle, but it's, it's, it's quite different. So the, the personality traits and behaviors are basically genetically determined and they're usually on a scale. So, you know, let's say you take aggression or violence, you know, and there are about, you know, for each of these, say an average about 15 genes that code for each trait, like aggression or ought to, or what you call it, or empathy, et cetera. So each of them has about 15 different genes involved. Sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 100, but let's say 15 on average. And so you inherit from your mother one form of the gene, one allele, and then from your father, another allele. And it's the combination of all those alleles it's like a you know throwing dice at a casino how they roll up one six six one three three two three and those numbers being whether they're high activity or low activity high aggression low aggression high emotional empathy low emotional empathy these all will add up to provide a, a sort of a roadmap of your basic personality now most people like any casino game they're going to be they're going to be throwing five sixes and sevens you know a kind of an equal mix from the uh, and those are what we call normal people. These are the normal traits of, of people. Uh, but there are people who are rolling ones, you know, just once in, in snake eyes and also sixes, which are at the far end. So you get people, normal people now, these are not pathological, who are very aggressive. They inherit all, you know, they're, just so happens their mother and father have a lot of these and you inherit the most aggressive forms of these alleles of these uh, genes that affect, for example, aggression and violence. And so if you have that, you grow up to be very aggressive. It doesn't mean you're a psychopath. It doesn't mean you're a criminal. It doesn't mean you're abnormal. You're on the normal range, except you're very aggressive. And these are the people who, you know, they hate to lose anything, extremely competitive. Uh, these are people who are quite aggressive. And, uh, and there are other people who are just born like pussycats. You know, they don't care about, they don't have to win anything. They don't have to, and so these are in a normal scale. So there's no genes for these, uh, for these like personality or psychiatric disorders per se. But if you take those genes and something happens early on in life, this is where this epigenetic marking comes. The epigenetics is taking a part of those specific genes. And a lot of times it's not, the genes that's that are making an enzyme per se, but the part of the gene of the gene that is the promoter or the inhibitor. What's it's kind of the you know, the gas pedal or the brake that turns that up or down. So you have these promoters, these these gas pedals and brakes turning it up and down. So in the case of the most famous warrior gene, aggression violence related gene, which is the promoter for the MAOA uh, uh, gene and that's monoamine oxidase A. It's the promoter region for that. And monoamine oxidase A regulates the amount of serotonin in the brain. And the serotonin, of course, has to do with lots of things, but would include uh, being mellow. You know, it's like it, it, being, serotonin is always associated with sleep and mellowness and all that and, uh, in, in, in many different functions. So it's if you have this, the allele, two of these alleles together, the promoters that are very high aggression for MAOA, that would be the warrior gene itself. And that's one of a number of 15 or so of these. But if you get enough of these, you're going to be a very aggressive, competitive person, and maybe even up to the obnoxious level. Uh, but you're not going to be a criminal, certainly not a psychopath. But as was found out in 2002, 2003 by uh, by Crespi and, 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 and others so almost 20 years ago, that if you inherit these alleles for the warrior gene in this case, and you're also abused early between birth and about two years old, uh, then this is a bad outcome. And so somebody who was born with these genes, uh, this is the nature part, right? You're born with the genes of the nature part. Uh, but then if the nurture early on from birth until two years old is early abuse, abandonment, abandonment is, 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 is abuse, but any kind of severe, you know, pretty bad abuse, especially chronic abuse when you're very, very young, uh, growing up in a terrible family, you know, uh, and you have those genes, then you have the nature-nurture interaction, which is what epigenetics is. 
And, and the problem with these early epigenetic events around birth to, 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 to two years old is that they're permanent. Now we all undergo epigenetic changes, you know, with COVID, the flu, et cetera, with any sort of infection, your immune system undergoes these temporary epigenetic changes to alter the promoters and the genes for the different antibodies. It was creating new antibodies, making that adjustment. So it undergoes, and that's why if you're exposed to a, you know, a bug, a virus, whether it's, you know, a, a SARS uh, or, you know, influenza or whatever, that you, 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 there's an exposure and then it takes time for you to get the disease. But at that time, your, your system, your lymphoid system, your immune system is going through epigenetic changes to turn on and off different parts of the machinery. So this happens all the time, but then after you're done with it, they turn off and it goes away. It's a temporary epigenetic change. The problem with these uh, changes that affect the early brain development, especially those areas having to do with violence, aggression, uh, empathy, the ones that are associated with psychopathy and other personality disorders, then uh, if you have this early epigenetic change, which is due to stress, the, the child is being abused or abandoned, causes a stress, the stress is perceived uh, by the brain uh, and, and then releases what is, uh, what is called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. And then that travels from the pituitary down to the adrenal gland, releases cortisol, which is a major stress hormone. The cortisol will then go through the body and induce changes, but it goes to the frontal lobe, especially. And there it will cling on to uh, different promoters. Okay. And, and it'll permanently turn on these having to do uh, with aggression, violence. Uh, you know, the, the kind of empathy you have, et cetera, associated with these disorders. So it becomes this permanent change that's so awful. So things that happen early. So if you say, is it due to nature or nurture? The answer is yes. You know, it's both happening together at the same time, very early, birth to about two years old, but only in people who have the genetic machinery. So if you're abused early, you know, we all know people, you know, they get thrown down the stairs, little kids, and they, they stand up, they're laughing, right? It doesn't affect them at all. A lot of them, most people are not wired genetically to have this awful response of becoming like a psychopath. Uh, most people will, they may be mad. Uh, they may try to get even. They may be careful, may be angry, but they don't have this permanent change that leads to this personality disorder, which is a is is basically psychopathy is a, uh, is inter intraspecies uh, predation, that is within the species, within a human, a uh, predation of one person on another. Okay. And so I know with like the DSM, they have the antisocial personality disorder, the cluster Bs. Um, and then I guess psychopathy is considered more of a construct. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and, and so you have, the, and there's a problem with the DSM, the five, well, the DSMs, and this will change you know, as soon as all of us, all guys and gals uh, die, uh, because nobody wants to learn all the new statistics, the new genetics, the new ways of categorizing them. So the kind of the, the, over the past 20 years, we've been working on what's this RDOC, which is a dimensional analysis of psychiatric disorders, as opposed to this categorical thing where you, you check off, okay, are you impulsive? Check. Are you a cold and, and, and you know, check? And then you add up all the check marks and it comes out with a score. And that score you then officially clinically become or categorically become like a psychopath or have a, another or narcissistic personality disorder or histrionic, et cetera. And, and so the problem is there's a lot of overlap with the symptoms, especially in terms of empathy and aggression with these. So they're not any one thing right? There, you, you, you end up all these different traits and the traits overlap. So it's not a clean separation. So, uh, you know, we're all trying to, we're trying to change this, but it takes a long time to change it because it hurts your head to have to relearn all the psychiatry. You, really, you know, a lot of people don't know about genetics, psychiatrists, a lot of them, you know, the younger ones do. So you got to wait until the oldest generation dies and then, then the change occurs. And that'll probably occur within 15 or 20 years now, it started 15, 20 years ago. 
and uh, and 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 we were involved in the first our lab and our and our groups uh, started doing this, which is personalized medicine for psychiatry. It's individualized psychiatry, also biological psychiatry, where we're taking these you know you know different functional scans, the genetics, psychometrics, and we created a a statistical model then to see each gene how it overlaps with these connectomes, these the alterations in the brain connection. So this is very different than what most psychiatrists and psychologists were trained with. And who wants to go back to medical school? Who wants to go back and you know people will just resist it, and you know insurance companies will resist it, and the in the you know the FDA will resist. There's all this resistance because you know basically laziness and ignorance. And who wants to do it? But they will happen. So I gave you too long an answer, but you're right. That is a construct. And so, yeah. and, you know, there's an overlap between ASPD, antisocial personality disorder, which is kind of the official term, mm -hmm. uh, that with psychopathy, right? Mm -hmm. And and that oh, that overlap is not 100%. And, and then if you add in things like sociopathy, which is you know, you can have the psychopaths and sociopaths have the same exact behavior, but for different reasons, very different reasons. So they're different. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a whole chunk of people in psychology and psychiatry who go back to the old Cleckley. And he started talking about this in 1946, 47. Mm -hmm. uh, and and th that's the way of looking, because he studied psychopaths as as a psychiatrist, not as a criminal population. So if you look at it as a criminal population, Robert Hare did. And Robert Hare is trained in all this stuff. But anyway, when people use that, it's more toward this criminality as opposed to these all these other important traits that are not covered. So whenever you think of psychopathy, you always think of violence, rape, murder, uh, yeah. and, and criminality. And a lot of it has not it really is not that at all. But it's certainly manipulation of one in abuse of one human on another. Yes, I know. I read somewhere that like if they do studies like on prison populations about, is it 25% have psychopathy in the prison population or is it higher? Well, it's that are categorical, but there are a lot of people who are borderline uh, or sub, you know, subclinical have a lot of the traits and that a lot of the people you meet, if you, if you include those, mm -hmm. uh, then you're getting up to more to like 10%. And these are people who are capable of that stuff even though they're not full categorical 30 plus hair rated psychopaths, right? They can still do a lot of damage. And so, uh, so the, the, the number in the pop, whole population is about one and a half percent. But if you include all these subclinical cases, you get more, more up to you know, seven, eight percent. And if you include all the people with similar personality disorders that mm -hmm. are where the predatory of one uh, people up on other people, you're getting up to me, you know, fifteen percent of the population. It's a lot of people, right? Yep. And you meet them and you and you try to find, you try to stay away from them because you're not going to cure them. A lot of people make the mistake of, uh, you know, I know he's a good boy inside, and we're going to fix him. No, you're not. No, no, no. no, no. And, and then also, they're comorbid <laughs> with other um, disorders like narcissism, histrionic, borderline. So it's you or dark triad. There's like a mix of things typically going right. on in the. That's right. And, uh, you know, yeah, th so there are these non official ways of looking at it, right? Like the dark triad isn't really used by clinicians, but it, it's used by a lot of people uh, to add in these other things like sadism. For example, sadism is not a part of psychopathy. Mm -hmm. You can have, you can have psych psychopaths or sadists, but it's not a core feature of it. Mm -hmm. But once you start adding uh, sadism, then you start to get in more to the dark. Uh, uh, triads and tetrads right uh, where they're really monstrous people that people are used to seeing in tv and movies and right that there's not too many of of those but they're exciting to sit and watch on a saturday night on the tv right or sometimes you hear people you know mistakenly say like if they're psychopathic they're insane but they're that's not necessarily no, no. true there are a lot of no I mean, no it's not insanity it, there's not insanity there. Not as, people think it's crazy or insane. It's not that at all. Mm -mm. These are men. No, they're not. They're not. They're not insane or crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a big mistake because you, you know a classic thing is somebody who always have bad teeth and it's like a kind of like crazy and little psycho. It's like you yeah. know that, that old that <laughs> reefer madness thing where mm -hmm. you know they would show people like really yeah freaked out. You know there's 
they're not psychopathic. They're, they're, they may be psychotic. They may be psycho, but they're not. Not insane. They're, they're not insane per se. No, they yeah. can. There are some that can be insane too. That's another. You sure. Have, uh, sure. Top so if we were just to look at maybe some of the core features of psychopathy, um, if somebody was trying to spot it, what would you say are the core features of it? Uh, so somebody sitting at a bar talking to a stranger, uh, somebody meeting somebody at a party or at work uh, for the first time. Do you, do you mean in that situation? Oh, I just mean like usually it's like they have no fear. That would be like a core feature, lack of empathy, recklessness. Well, yeah. Well, well, you're but at least you're saying how would you recognize it? You're, oh, yeah. You, Usually you'd meet people like that in a bar yeah. or a party or something, right? Yeah. They so go up and you yeah. say, what are they? Well, you know, a, a lot of them are very sweet. I mean, what they're trying to do is to get into your pants. Now, maybe not sexually, but they may get into your pants or your money. Wallet. <laughs> so they want a wallet or something. They yeah. want to own you in some way. So they're the not. Being, oriented. Very, yeah, they're goal oriented. And, and many are very, quite patient. So they can be working on, you know, mm -hmm. one guy could be working on three or four women at work or at bars, going to different bars at one time. They're they're like grooming they're, their they're grooming them, yeah. Yeah. And one thing that uh, that psychopaths have is, is cognitive empathy. They don't have emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. Most people think of empathy as all emotional. It's not. There are several kinds of empathy. Yeah. And emotional empathy is what you want. It's that warm, fuzzy, I cry with you. you I laugh with you. We, we, we parallel each other. It's the emotional sort of mirroring that mm -hmm. people think is empathy. Well, that's the emotional empathy, but there's cognitive empathy. And cognitive empathy is I understand what you're feeling. I understand your, you know, your happiness. I understand your sadness. I don't feel it, but I, uh, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And and you can see this is a can be a very good thing because a lot of people who are in, involved in, in charity, illy masonary, and, and uh, don't have emotional empathy. They don't cry all the time. There's a lot of people. The people who cry tend not to give money. You know, they, they just, I feel, you know, I feel for you and they cry. It's the people who have co cognitive empathy will say, look, at, I understand these people are in pain. I'm going to send money or I'm going to do something about it. So it's a lot of the times the people that really change the world, do something, don't have that emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it's a normal trait, cognitive empathy, but it's also the one that psychopaths have. Mm -hmm. And what this allows them to do is read your mind, read your emotions. So when they're, when they're talking to you, they're looking for the weaknesses in you. And so they're prompting you with things. So a lot of times, if you, let's say you have a girlfriend who says, look, I just took the nicest guy and he didn't talk about himself. He talked about me. He talked about, well, this is, this is a word. It's a red, a red, some guy comes up and he's all, you know, egotistical and stuff like that. That's not your psychopath mm -hmm. because the psychopath wants you to open up to them. And so they're very sweet and nice. That's why if somebody asks, you know, who is the most really classic psychopathic president we ever had i'm not saying we had a full-on psychopath but the full it would be bill clinton so i love you baby who loves you baby mm -hmm. it's those I feel people, your pain. People, yeah they're <laughs> sweet talking and the people who piss you off are not the psychopaths and and people get they think it's the people you get angry at of the psychopaths it's, it's not them at all it's the ones who are so nice he's listening to me he understands me well his whole they job you yeah. Oh, he's, he's absolutely. And the more they learn, they find your weaknesses out. And that's the process. So you're mm -hmm. you. So you're tending to look so, for somebody who's still too understanding, too sweet and positive, And who who is trying to it really makes you feel good. That's red that flags, red flags. Yeah. 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 Um, I know, like for a lot of women are let's let's talk about this real quick. Like you see more psychopaths in the male population than the female population. Why is that so? Well, th that definition is changing. Okay. It, and, yeah, more it, women have become psychopathic. That's true. Well, I like what my, my wife and her girlfriends, you know, they, they tell me, they say, you want to know what a psychopath is? You, you get to find a 12-year-old girl uh, getting even with one of her girlfriends or mm -hmm. trying to destroy one of her girlfriends. They, they, there's yeah. the, psycho the psychopathy. And, and usually with the females, as it turns out, there was always thought to be less number. But what they do is use like men to do their killing or, or other women. To, they, they use weak people to do their dirty work. And so they, they are more distanced 
from the act. So they all of a sudden, you know, well, no, I was never in jail, but you're the one that caused everybody else to get in trouble. That, so it's now there are more, it's, it's seen that uh, women are, are almost just about the same rate as men, but they tend to use people. They, they're not going to go beat people up usually, right? They're going to find somebody to beat you up, or they're going to find somebody to poison, they're going to poison you, or they're going to find somebody to ruin your life. That sort of manipulation, that manipulative sort of uh, person. That's and so, and, and women are quite capable of that. Mm. Would you say that some of this cancel culture is psychopathic? Oh, completely. Sure. I mean, it's the it's legal way. Running it's the legal that. way to get to, to get, and it may be more sociopathic. You know, the sociopaths are usually young, the, the person who may not be wired as a, genetically as a psychopath, but who may have been bullied. They weren't too good looking, little fat kid, the girl that couldn't get a date, the boy that could, you know, the, um, it, it, maybe not good looking enough, didn't feel fit in. So a lot of people who feel like they're out of society growing up during the so-called growth phase from, you know, about five years old till puberty, and, and often they're, and they're bullied. So they may not be wired genetically, but they get bullied or they feel left out. And, and you know, they're, they're, not, the, they're, they're not popular. They, uh, and so they spend the rest of their life getting even. And the cancel culture is a great way for these sociopaths to get even with people and, and blame it on something else. As part of, a big part of this is externalization mm -hmm. of blame for both yeah. psychopaths and sociopaths. Yeah. They blame somebody, oh no, it's, not only your fault, now I've got a venue. Mm -hmm. I've got a cancel culture to really destroy you uh, legally. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's absolutely, cancel culture is all. It's, and I would call it more like a complete sociopathic thing than any. Yeah. It People reminds me of, of the 12 year old girl example you were giving that, you know, spread gossip and rumors and try to reputation ruin. That's like yeah. a like a junior high girl, what she might be doing. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And that's what this is, you know, and, and I got this from my wife, I, you know, and her girlfriends. She, I, she's got a lot of girlfriends and they crack up. And they said, no, yeah, the real the psychopaths or sociopaths are these 12 year old girls. And, and they would recognize this, the cancel culture as that. It's the people who feel like losers uh, early on. And they now this is a, a way to get even. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. It seems to be about. Yeah, I, think I, I agree. Yeah. Um, another key thing I've noticed with psychopaths is their ability to not care and um, whether it's about their relationships, a job or like they just don't care. And so can you speak to where that comes from, that lack of caring about anything? Well, this lack of emotional connection, which is the emotional empathy, it comes, that's the core part of it is mm -hmm. the not really caring at an emotional level. You can care like, yeah, that that battle, that war, that violence bothers me, but I don't feel it doesn't, you know, I don't care. Or I I don't like that person beating up that person, but I don't feel it emotionally. It doesn't get yeah. me. Uh, but I, I don't like it. it. It it lacks a certain beauty and balance or whatever. Yeah. And and so uh yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that statement too. Yeah. And especially like in um, in love relationships, they not may not feel the deep love. So like when it when they break up, they might be bummed for a couple hours, but then they just don't care. They're not going to feel like the heartbreak of maybe somebody who has that empathy. Yeah, and you know it's and so if you look at those heartbreak and bonding, uh, we put it in terms of neuroscience and genetics. You know you've got oxytocin, vasopressin, mm -hmm. different types of testosterone receptor. You know, some men who have a, and it's not the level of testosterone as much as the type of receptor, because those with one kind of allele, one receptor that they inherited, uh, and if they inherit two of those, they tend to be these men that are very selfish. They win and they don't give anything away. Whereas there are other people, other other men who are very aggressive and they'll, they'll, they'll make, a, let's say, a lot of money, have a lot of power, but they'll spread it around. They'll give it away. You know, they're not selfish about it. So the accrual of, of money and power is different than the use of it. And, mm -hmm. and that's an interaction of oxytocin, vasopressin, androgen receptor, uh, and, 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 and about four other uh, main genes that do that. And so it, 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 which interacts with the type of empathy. So uh, so again, there's about 15 different transmitters and transmitter receptors that would go into that. And it's very, you know, it's a normal thing for people 
it, the classic thing is the is the is 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 the father who just has kids, and they don't feel connected to the kids at all emotionally. They say, "That's my kid. I'll take care of the kid." It's not until the child grows up and becomes a, like you know is talking and develops personality that they start to bond. Now, and people know this. It's very normal. And people try to make it well. You don't care. Well, they it's not there. It's, how can you blame somebody? You got to make believe. It's like watching somebody make believe they're crying, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but also, some women have that. They inherit this where they don't bond with their with their infants at yeah. all. And yeah. it and people go, it's a terrible thing. But it's a it's normal. It's it's not you know it's a small part of the population. It's part of the normal distribution, and they can't help it. They're not trying to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they and it's hard to fake it too. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People know when you're faking things after a while, certainly or very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so there are successful psychopaths out there. They're not all ending up in jail. They're not all the Ted Bundys, the Jeffrey Epstein's, you know, et cetera. There are successful uh, psychopaths that gravitate towards certain vocations, for example, like military, uh, CEOs of businesses, lawyers, sales, surgeon, tend to have a higher number of psychopaths than, say, other service-oriented um vocations yeah right up there is journalism journalism, journalism yes, yes journalism is the thing that really attracts the most because you there is the there's the way you can manipulate whole groups large groups of people it's yep. a natural draw you know for a physician to do it one person at a time you're going to torture no 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 i think it's of a hard. surgeon though to be able to cut into flesh you have to be detached from that. You have you to be. You don't you want somebody, out. no, you don't want a neurosurgeon, a gastrointestinal surgeon is crying. Oh, I feel your pain. I'm crying. Who the hell yeah. needs that? And, and so <laughs> that's very functional. You don't want, yeah. the, you don't want the leader of a country to have all this crying empathy. You want somebody who's going to make cognitive good decisions and not fake this sort of empathy. I feel, you know, do the Bill Clinton thing. I'm, I'm with you. Oh, God. That guy cracks me up. Guys love yeah. him. Because he's yeah. like the biggest scoundrel in the world. Okay, so, yeah. um, but anyway, and so, you know, these are very functional things to have, traits to have for certain professions. But mm -hmm. journalism attracts it, and the type of CEO that's attracted by it is really not people think of it as the big corporations, not them, the startup companies. Mm -hmm. So the startup firms, especially in finance, but in anything, that's where you find that's attracted. To where they can manipulate the books early on, they can manipulate the fundraising early on. That's where you find the psychopaths. The larger companies, and I've worked with probably a hundred different CEOs of medium and very large and really large companies. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not psychopaths, you know. You don't find them there, you know. Uh, but the small companies uh, definitely. So it's mm. the small company CEOs, uh, the, the journalists. The uh, is it because I they can hide and get away with things better and less people to answer to? Well, they have the power, you know, mm -hmm. they have the power, they, they're, they're given the mandate, mm -hmm. you know, go get them, you know, so it's, uh, and a lot of people will make believe they don't like psychopathy, but they'll say, I hate a cheater, but look at, you're my investor, you, you could cheat for me, you can cheat on the taxes for me, you can cheat mm -hmm. on that for me, you could steal that for me. So people are very hypocritical. So yeah. they'll make believe they don't like their leaders and their finance people, but they'll actually employ these people and say, go get them, go get them. You go yeah. kill them. Go. Yeah. So it, the, the hypocrisy is pretty rife. Yeah. So how ethical is it to do personality tests in workplaces to kind of like, I want that type of person and, and you know, for this type of job, because I know, you know, the functional part of it. Well, you can make a case that anybody for any job should come in have for genetic tests brain imaging, psychometric tests, all these personality tests, you can make a great case for it, right? It will make, uh, it, it, it will make the society and businesses very efficient. It's like, you know, we can get rid of psychopathy if we could go in and test every child when they're born and, and talk to the parents to really go in and snoop. But they're the cure. The cure or the prevention is worse than the actual... You know, the problem where you you're stepping on people's rights, their, their individual rights. And this is a big deal now, right? It's like, and this is happening as we speak. I mean, we've got a whole group of people who wanted to lord it over you. And what they say is, 
we want you to have all the testing done. We have all this stuff. We want you to, to get into your pants uh, to control you because we're protecting other people. This is what any dictatorial group ever said. You know, mm-hmm. this is classic stuff. And this is how they, you know, would justify it. And so there are ways of preventing problems in the workplace to choosing optimal people. I've worked on James Mattis, you know, he was the Secretary of Defense, and I worked in the DOD with the Pentagon people. And for, for years, I've worked with the military to get, you know, how do you get better soldiers? How do you get ones that won't be, you know, aren't psychopaths? How do you get ones that won't have, get PTSD or, su- or commit suicide? Mm-hmm. And so, you, so there are ways that you can say, look, at, we're trying to build a perfect soldier. That's, that's just another example. Mm-hmm. Um, and that involves all this testing. But anything can be abused, right? Any powerful thing can be abused. So you can end up just be a Luddite and say, we don't want to do any of this technology. We want to do anything. Let's just, uh, you know, let's stay primitive. And I mean, that's the old hippie thing. I grew up in that era where it's just, uh, you know, really Luddite and and sort of this agricultural Antifa sort of existence. Well, you know, if you look around the world, all it seems like the psychopaths rise to the top. Like they're the leaders of countries and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Is that just kind of the trend that we're going to keep seeing? Yeah, I studied dictators and, and uh, have, and I work with groups, human rights groups uh, as an advisor on them on different dictators and their overthrow. So we work with this, I work with dissidents, dissident groups, and I work with two, really three different groups, human rights groups to frankly get rid of dictators, you know, but we do it peacefully, not through violence, right? So you have to have all this information. And, and so I'll end up meeting with the dissident groups. And, and one of the things I've been asked to do is to, to see if the person coming in to these places is worse than the person already there. You know, it, it could get worse and worse. Yeah. But I've worked with people who know closely, you know, who and uh, have worked with, uh, uh, you know, Putin, uh, but also, I work with people in Ukraine, the former prime minister of Chechnya, former president of Ukraine, and all sorts of countries, and, and work mm-hmm. with dissident groups in, in North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, and, uh, and to, because, you know, I'm interested in the nature of good and evil, and I have enough of a taste of it in my head, you know, to appreciate uh, a, a con artist when it's, uh, or somebody who's up to really no good, but that's a ethical, which is the rules and morals, really fundamental morals, a judgment. And um, so, and so that's, you know, then I'm imposing my own values when mm-hmm. I'm making that judgment, which is, this, you know, and I, so you got to be careful for yourself. So, you know, for me, I'm politically a libertarian, I'm an agnostic, and I bring that religious and political bias in with me. And I try to be open about that because of, uh, it's important, you know, when somebody, you know, if you're, if you're hired by somebody, if you're working with a group as a, you know, I, I just, I, I don't do this for money. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you want to be open about your, everything about yourself uh, mm-hmm. in order to do this, because you bring in this baggage with you. Mm-hmm. And this is what, you know, the most interesting thing we talk about journalism, where, well, you know, these journalists in the past two years have come out uh, and it was just amazing. They said, no, this is, we have no interest in being fair. This is propaganda. We're proud to be part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, we had, we, we had journalists at CNN, MSNBC, mm-hmm. WAPO, et cetera, who've admitted this, which is yeah. to somebody from our generation is like a horror show. Yeah. You know, and that's so also you're going to know by our generation, right, which is boomer mm. uh, with all these things then affect that, you know, our mm-hmm. sense of justice is Martin Luther King and that equality, not mm-hmm. equity. So you have to make it open in the groups you're working with. I'm just telling you what I do, you know, it's like uh, about all of this. So they understand the bias, the old biases. Most definitely. I think another core feature that you find with psychopathy is um not taking responsibility and speaking of the journalists like they report the story changes they don't take responsibility you see that a lot of times too yeah yeah it's that's where it's the most dangerous because they reach most people mm-hmm. uh, forget these big ceos you're, you're not going to find it there a lot of them are pussycats these these women and men who are ceos of large and, and i'm not talking about the super super large ones that's another mm-hmm. story you know yeah. they they're involved in this 
uh, fascist uh, interaction yeah. with governments. I'm talking about the regular large corporations, medium-sized yeah. corporations, which are pretty big actually, uh, all the way down uh, yeah. to, yeah. So as far as like the future of psychopathy and treating it, if that is even a thing that people are looking at, I know there's like the CRISPR gene therapy and I know there's positive traits associated with the people that don't wanna change it. So what is the future of this field? Yeah, we, I mean, I'm a, the chief scientific officer of a new company that uses CRISPR uh, testing for changing people's brain activity, okay? Which goes directly to the point. I mean, we're not, we're not looking at cancer or things like that. We're looking at actual traits we're talk, talking about. So that my, my interest is, is there and our interest is, is in that. And one of the things is, can we use CRISPR gene editing with other physiological tools to um, uh, in, in people with personality disorders like psychopaths, can that be, can you change that? The problem with the personality disorders is uh, that they're hardwired. These are, you know, they're unmyelinated and myelinated brain tracks. The unmyelinated ones like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, they're unmyelinated. They're not covered with this, you know, this, this insulating, tough insulating material. And they're very plastic. You hear the brain is plastic. It's plastic that way, but it's not plastic the way people want to, which is these pathways that are laid down that are myelinated and they don't, they're not plastic. You know, there can be functional pathways that are plastic, but anatomically, you're not going to rewire them any more than you're going to cut into your computer and then kind of hope they throw together all the, the components and hope it works. It's not that way. So there are plastic parts, but most of these problems are developed early they're in the limbic system. That is the emotional regulating part of the brain at the base of the brain, temporal lobe, amygdala, insula, prefrontal cortex, cingulate, those ancient areas of the brain. And those develop early, like I was saying, from birth until several years old. And when those are hardwired, that's probably it. So I, you know, I, I, I know groups and I know scientists and clinicians who are, are studying reversing this. So they'll take people, uh, and the thing is, I've never seen it really work. Everything works temporarily. It's like, well, you got to, it's like any addict, any, anybody who goes like me, I'm on another diet, you know, January 1st, you have these great plans. And then by January 8th, you're tearing the refrigerator door off again, yeah. or you're back to drinking or doing, you know, or uh, hypersexual activity, whatever that you're mm -hmm. trying to change. So everybody can, everything works and then it doesn't work. And only maybe five, six percent of people can really change these hardwired things. So there will be a few people who can be changed because every day they say, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to do that to people. I'm not going to every day, every day. That's hard to do for your, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So does does the condition get worse or with aging? Does there is that something that happens? Well, you know, the, the aggression part, the aggression and violence part, as you from about 50 or so on. Uh, in men and women, their sex steroid levels change. And what happens is that the, it, it turns out that the your level of aggression has to do with the ratio of testosterone to estrogen in men and women, mm -hmm. and uh, for both. And as men get older, the testosterone goes down. And um, so the T to E ratio goes way down and they become pussycats. I'll use Bill Clinton again. He got older, he got to more of a pussycat. You see a lot of men, when they get older, they become not aggressive, not assertive. And whereas the women they're with become much more aggressive and assertive. You know, it's like Hillary. And in that case, most women, what happens is that their testosterone goes up, but and the estrogen goes down. So they become naturally with aging more aggressive. And you can find this, um, you know, I'm of the age and my, my wife has lots of girlfriends and I've known a bunch of them for many years and you can see it in them, how they've become more aggressive. It's a crack up. I'm not saying they're violent, but yeah. you know, they're, they're more aggressive whereas the guys are all pussycats. And uh, so with age, the actual, the people with personality disorders where the aggression and violence is important, like in psychopathy mm -hmm. or, or uh, NPD, in that case, the, the behaviors go down. It actually corrects itself, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, that part of it, at least, yeah. Yeah, but the empathy component is never to be found. I mean, you cannot, like you said, you can have the cognitive empathy, but they, they can never feel it. 
No, so the wiring is not there. I mean, mm -hmm. people like with everything, and this is a kind of plasticity, if you will, is you try to fake it, right? Mm -hmm. You pair it and mimic. Yeah, you, you mimic. So people learn to mimic things. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's a form, I guess, of plasticity. Or just forcing yourself with, with me when I found out what I was really about, I then have to spend every day of my life saying, be a good guy, be a good person. When you're having an interaction with that person, do the thing that normal guys in my age, my you know, would do. And I have to yeah. think about it all the time. Is that is that so that's being pro-social, not anti-social. It's turning it, yeah. It, well, pro-social means not being a nice person. Pro-social just means that you have the tools to get around in society without being detected. So the pro-social traits are being glib. Mm. Hi, how's it going? I love you. You know, all this stuff, kind of this light stuff. Yeah, that's pro-social okay. and, and being able to play the, to act it out, but also to have the natural abilities of leadership. Like, yeah. you know, she came into the room and she's got that light around her, you know, that wonderful light. Charisma. So leadership light, or he comes in, you know, those are all pro-social traits. It doesn't mean they're going to be nice to you though. Mm -hmm. So now that's different than, uh, than trying to, suppress your very selfish basic drives yes. uh and and whether it's eating drinking too much or, or being a jerk mm -hmm. which is what i you know my natural thing is to be kind of a jerk and so i have to actively suppress it all the time mm -hmm. it's exhausting. Um, yeah i bet um so we're kind of coming to the end here it, is there anything else with regarding the field of psychopathy that you would like to share or leave the viewers with well and I never really do this. I, I swear I never do it. But my book is still, has got a lot of the science in it, the genetics, the behaviors and everything. And I wrote it for the smart layperson. And then some of it's a little bit dense, but I think the, the book is still good. You know, the psychopath inside. Um, it, it, reading that has still has a lot. I, I wouldn't change much in there at all still based on what we know. It's nothing fundamentally different. I I think people could do that, or or there are other books that are written by scientists and clinicians on it that are written for lay people that are you know are, are pretty good, um, and some are just pop. You know, they're just pop fun, and 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 so um, that would be you know, my recommendation. But uh, it's it's interesting that most of the people in, interested and in who know about it are young women about psychopathy, this stuff. It, it's, it's amazing. Even a 16 year old girl, because I work with you know, high school students, their mm. groups and college and the, and the women, uh, the girls and the women really know a lot about it. They're kind of tuned into it and they should, right? They tend to be mm -hmm. more, uh, victims of this stuff, except when it's uh, from their you know, girlfriends, what they're doing to, with each other. So um, it's amazing what they know. So they'll tell me things I've never heard of. And especially they say, have you read this book? You read this book? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. You know, so. Um, it, it might be getting into the biology of women, you know, having a affinity for like the dominant man, you know, the bad boy. And so they might've experienced maybe dating somebody with psychopathy and that's what opened their interest in looking into it further. Yeah, somebody, usually almost everybody has been hit on in a bad way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And some people just doesn't bother them. Like my wife, she doesn't care. She's just not wired that way in me. And, uh, and, and so there's a whole bunch of people, that, women I know that may have had a, uh, an experience with a, with a jerk, with, a, with their next husband or boyfriend, mm -hmm. or somebody in their life. And it just doesn't bother them. They say I got to avoid jerks like that. The others, you know, most of the people, if you if you go to these these candlelight vigils outside of prisons where there are women who have made relationships right. yeah. with these murderers, yeah. um, all of those were are abused women. Yeah. And they're just playing the, the movie over and over and again to kind of make it right in their head. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who are attracted to it. Uh, it's their way of self-medicating by being drawn to it. You know, you yeah. drawn to the bad boy. It seems ridiculous, but you know, unless you, I guess you've been traumatized. I haven't. So I don't, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I get, you know, if you've been traumatized, you, it's, it really works you over some people day and night. It's awful. And mm -hmm. so they find ways of dealing with it. And some is by, 
you know, looking at those movies or you know, going to the prisons. That's not very many people, yeah. but in getting get closer to those kinds of men that abuse them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the, the uncle or father that abused them and they're drawn toward men like that to kind of either fix them or mm -hmm. to reprocess it over and over again. Yeah. The Just trauma like bonding. Yeah. Yeah. Trauma bonding. Uh, also, like I know um, a lot of times for, for women, they might have to only look at, you know, the man's wake of his past. For example, if he's like married a woman, made a baby with her, left her, married another woman, made a baby with her, left her. Like he has babies and, and mothers all over the place like that. That's why it's important to pay attention to what they do, not what they say. That's that's really key. Yeah, but people are in denial all the time. See, I'm the one who can change you. I see the good way. You see it all the time. Oh, true. Any, Those, any, yeah, any, women need to wake up with that one. Yeah. If you laugh at them or do something like that, or you try to correct it, they don't want to. They won't listen to you. It's 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 interesting. It's like they're just moths going into the fire again, um, and it's really, and not to make fun of it, it's kind of it's kind of sad to watch. Yeah, definitely. Well, very cool. I sure do appreciate you coming on my channel today. This has been enlightening and I uh, hope somebody got some really good information to kind of uh, learn more about this uh, construct of psycho psychopathy. So I thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Lisa. And for my steer. Oh, steer, yes, that's so guess, funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we both, both say uh, thank you and uh, yes, this works it, out. Yes, and if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching.